Hello from me, I'm Johnny. Um, I'm a founder of Stir to Action. Um, I'm the editor of Stir Magazine and I'm the program designer for the New Economy program, which is currently online, but it's our democratic learning and action platform. And Salgars Mill, which is our residential training center that I've just mentioned, we're programming here, hoping to start from kind of March, April next year, but we'll see where we are at that point next year, right? Um, so we, this is the end of the first day. Um, we've had some great sessions, but we've still got day two and day three, Wednesday, Thursday. Um, so still plenty more sessions to join. I'm really excited about this panel because a lot of the work that Stir to Action has been doing has been about centering and bringing focus to the question of ownership in a way that just doesn't feel it has the attention that it that, that it should have within so many movements. Um, and we, you know, we take the position that we think, like Yancey's piece kind of described and outlined, that ownership will be the defining feature of how we recover from this economic crisis from COVID. So we really, really need to start bringing that into the conversation. Um, I've known Jessica since 2016, um, interviewed her in her office on Fifth Avenue in John Jay College in New York, just off Central Park, probably got the avenue. 10th, on there. 10th Avenue. Tenth yeah, okay. <laughs> it's a little different, a little different, yeah. Yeah, yeah a little nice. different. We had the river, though. We had the Hudson we had the River. river before, so we're kind of, yeah, east, east. I'm not even going to try west or east. Okay, move on. <laughs> um, and more recently, I've discovered the work of, of Yancey um, via his ad idea space, which is where he blogs. And the, the session title tonight was inspired by what he's covering that, which is looking at the ownership crisis and what the next few years will look like and how ownership is determines how we recover um, in terms of business and society. Um, so I'm gonna pass over to Dan Stanley, um, who's gonna chair this evening's session. Um, I'll stay involved across um, the next hour, um, but Dan's been working with us again, largely around democratic ownership and reframing it for new audiences um, and old audiences. Um, and Dan's been working across like high streets and heritage, young people, um, and more recently with our work with people of color in Preston too. Um, so thanks to Dan for chairing this evening session um, and let's get started. Thanks, Johnny. Yeah, so uh, I think one of the great things about this, I think this t title for this session is really good because it, it, I think it really nicely encapsulates what the discussion will be about. And I think there's two, two senses in which it can be understood. Um, um, the first is, the role of ownership in the current crisis that we're in and, and the crucial role it, it's had in, in, in um, moderating the outcomes for different people. Um, you know, the people that have owned assets and wealth have been affected much less, have been much more resilient, been able to be much more resilient than those who don't. Um, but then also the idea of ownership itself is obviously a very unequal and that's been the kind of direct um, reason that those those outcomes have been so unequal and because people are fundamentally less and less able to own assets and wealth across um equally across the um across the population um and that seems like a situation that's only going to worsen and so i think as johnny says addressing the the subject of ownership seems to get at the crux of, of the situation that we're in and how we can recover from um this situation in a better in a better place um, so just to introduce the two speakers, the main speakers we have today fully, um, Yancy Strickler is um, American author, entrepreneur and former music critic, and definitely check out his Spotify playlists, <laughs> I recommend those. Um, he co-founded Kickstarter, a uh, funding platform, created projects and wrote, this could be our future, a Penguin random house book on building society that looks beyond profit as its core organising principle and introduces a decision-making framework called Bentoism, which I hope we'll hear a little bit more about today. Um, and Jessica gordon Nemhard is a, an American political economist. She has published books and articles in major economics journals. She's currently a professor of community justice and social economic development in the Department of Fukana Studies at John Jay College, City University of New York. So thank you both for coming. Um, I think I'll start off by just asking each of you to talk for five to ten minutes on one aspect of this and, and Jessica if you'd like to make a start it'd be great to hear a bit about your thoughts um, 
on the connection between that connection between uh, ownership and particularly cooperative ownership and the crisis that we're in now and how we can look back on sort of previous crises crises uh, and how cooperative ownership has sort of played out in those situations and, and what are the kind of opportunities and challenges that, that that presents for the current situation that we're in. Right, thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here and excited for the whole festival. So um, most of my research has been uh, around uh, the history of African-American cooperatives, but I've also studied the benefits and impacts of cooperatives on communities. I've looked a little into credit unions and I've studied um, worker cooperatives, especially sort of late 20th century worker co-ops and, and, uh, and labor. So for this topic, I think the important things to talk about are the connections between realizing, understanding, seeing how cooperatives, you know, uh, mutuality, solidarity, collective ownership, and democratic governance of collective assets right, have actually often been born in crises because they solve economic problems like market failure, discrimination, uh, et cetera. And so that um, for me, the research on African-American cooperatives, the 1880s and the 1930s were two of the most prolific eras for um, co-op ownership in the U.S., particularly among African-Americans. And both of those eras were times where co-ops were first used to solve a problem, to address a crisis, local community ownership, right, mattered because the people who normally own the capital were not able or were not willing to provide the kind of economic activity, um, homes, mortgages, land, farms, jobs, right, that were needed. And so people came together and made those jobs for themselves, made those helped to buy land together, um, did co-op housing together, um, cotton mills, farms, et cetera, um, because it wasn't happening in the, in the mainstream. And often for African-Americans, it wasn't happening because in addition to mainstream market failures, there was additional racial discrimination and oppression. And so owning your own, owning it together, especially if you're a marginalized group who doesn't have a lot of assets or a lot of access to capital, pooling what resources you do have and owning that together made a huge difference. We also have research about the survival, right? Co-ops actually survive crises better. So if you already have a co-op, it's more uh, likely that it will survive a crisis than a regular small sole proprietor business. Um, and most of those, both why they, um, why we see them start up and why we see them survive better in crises have to do with, again, that sense of mutuality, solidarity, being able to pool and share resources, share risks, right? Um, and then the, um, the trust and solidarity that gets be developed between the people doing the social entrepreneurship and their communities also help to keep them lively, surviving longer, et cetera. And then there's a flexibility because of the, the uh, democratic governance, there's a flexibility in the actual business structure that allows adapt adapt adaption and change and that kind of thing. So um, I think I want to give you a couple of examples of what I mean from the 1930s, and then uh, I'll pass it on. So uh, 1930s, we know are still a Great Depression, though I think right now we're about to rival that. Um, and you know, I'll mention it, but I know we're going to talk about that more. Um, clearly, I've already seen, at least in the US and I think in other places, a growing interest again in mutuality, mutual aid, um, solidarity economics and cooperatives already um, at the beginning of this um, this new depression that we're about to enter and so people already are seeing I think in sort of some organic intuitive ways that really the only way to, is to survive is to pull together come together um, one example in the 1930s that was very important and that I use a lot in my research is Gary Indiana uh, a group 
of uh, some teachers and some local community members started a study group to look at what was happening with the disinvestment in their community. The great, the middle of the Great Depression, or the beginning of the Great Depression, the last bank branch has removed itself from their neighborhood. They don't have a gas station, they have no banking, very little access to food. And as they talked about these issues and talked about what to do about it, a couple of people talked about co-ops, they got some training in co-ops, they decided to start a, a co-op education program in the adult education school at the high school, and they talked and talked and learned and learned, and they decided to open up um, a buying club that turned into a grocery store, a co-op grocery store. They then developed a credit union, uh, a gas station, a co-op gas station, and then another branch of the grocery store within about three years. Um, so after a long period of study, they were able to each year open a new uh, co-op business or enterprise that addressed the problems they were facing during the Great Depression. The other really interesting part about that example is not just the range of activities, right, from credit union to food co-op to gas station, but also how important the education was so that they understood what collective ownership meant, um, why it was important how having control over what was happening economically in their community was so important and the way they could do that was through ownership, right? And so that making those connections, we have to own it, we have to be educated enough so that as owners, we can make the right decisions about how to work together and how to do this. Um, and then putting together the pieces, right? We don't just need food, we need financial services, we don't just need food and finance, we need gas, you know, access to gas station, those, so very deliberate strategic planning of what to own next, how to own it, what to own next. Um, the other really fascinating part of this history is that within a year, their gross co-op grocery store became the largest African-American owned grocery store in the country um, during the Great Depression. And so again, seeing how this collective ownership allowed them to do that and to do that so quickly right, to have a very stable, um, well-established uh, grocery store that was bringing in over $160,000 in sales per year in the middle of a depression. So that's one of those kinds of examples I want to talk about. The other one is more a rural example in North Carolina. Uh, there were two black independent schools in the 1930s that were doing, starting to practice some cooperative economics again during the Great Depression. The schools were actually teaching the parents how to start credit unions and farm co-ops so that the parents could have stable enough life so that they could actually allow their children to go to school, right? And so they connected this, helping the parents to be stable using cooperative ownership with schooling of young black children. And then what they also did was start to teach cooperative economics to the children and to the parents so that more co-ops, more uh, traffic, uh, sorry, not traffic, um, tractor sharing could happen, a credit union could be born, that kind of thing. And then the two schools who were about 30 miles apart realized they were doing similar things. So they created a council, a regional council of black co-ops. That regional council then created a statewide council. The statewide council started creating materials for how to start co-ops and how to start credit unions. They joined together with the State Department of Agriculture, and they were able to actually um, change the landscape in the state so that they went from two or three black co-ops in the early 1930s or the mid-1930s, and by 1948, they had helped to create 98 credit unions and 48 additional co-op enterprises. And so again, the education component, but also that notion that you needed, you know, this kind of collective ownership we needed to own for ourselves in order to do all these other things in addition to making a good life for our children. So I think my five minutes are probably up. You get the idea of how we're seeing, you know, um, an economic crisis in some cases, but it doesn't always have to be an economic crisis. Helps people to come together, but understanding that ownership is key, right? And the way that you own things together is gonna to be key to the longevity of it and also to solving the immediate problems.
You're muted, Daniel. Thanks, Jessica. <laughs> Am I still muted or am I? No, you're good now. Okay, there's a slight delay, I think, when you mute and unmute that makes it a little bit tricky to tell sometimes. But no, thank you very much. That was um, really fascinating and a great place to start from in the discussion, I think. Um, and we'll certainly be interested to come back and kind of explore some of the more specific questions with those historical uh, parallels um, and where the sort of similarities and differences are. Um, Jan, see, I, I've lost your video. If you, are, you, are you still there? Yeah. Or have we maybe got uh, video disappear. Oh, okay. Uh, Can't see yeah. you, but we can hear you. Respond. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm trying to turn my video Great. on. Great. So, yeah, I Sorry. mean, if you just want to kind of follow on from that, some ways. yeah. And yeah, um, um, yeah, I'd just be interested in your thoughts, really. On... Oh, this is late. Carry on. Go ahead. Um, yeah. Well, I think that uh, you know what, what's confusing and fascinating at this moment. Um, you know, I mentioned that we're heading into a Great Depression if if we are not already there. Um, but yet, there's this dissonance, of course, that um, markets are soaring, and and it seems um, irrational, perhaps. Um, but I, I think that we're we're seeing like the true economic consequences of this moment, like the market caps that are going to giant companies. That was all the money that was in small businesses. That was all income to workers that is going away and not coming back. Like I think. There Rationality and that we are seeing a giant transfer of income and wealth uh, for people who did not have it, people who already had it. And so there's just this wild dissonance where it is a, it is a great depression and it's simultaneously the greatest bull market possibly in history. And, and people are like waiting for there to be a market crash. I think there might not be. I think that maybe the capitalism has been waiting for there to no longer be workers and the idea that things are going to move to robots and option like gpt3 being created for ai a month ago like we so underestimate the impact of that um and so i think that we might be seeing fundamentally a new reality that large companies are quite prepared for that anyone that looks looks at things from a place of efficiency might say is preferable and in some in some there might be some cases in which it will be with the exception, of course, that 80% of human beings are left out of the system, are really are really left out of it in a fundamental way. And so, you know, as I, I wrote in uh, a post that we're using as the title for this, um, just unlike the Great Depression, where maybe everyone struggled, certainly if you were already wealthy, like it, you didn't struggle as much. But in this case, we're going to see 80% of people struggle and 20% of people like become stronger as a result of this. And, and any, anything I think you would say would say this is not tenable. Um, so, you know, I think that, that ownership becomes the focus point because um, we can, we can ask about income inequality. We can, we can try to nibble around the edges of it. But fundamentally, it's about how do we value labor? How do we value social structures that provide the space for all these things to exist? And, and there is a need for a fundamentally different kind of contract, a social contract, um, that I think this moment will end up producing after probably a decade of enormous pain. Um, but I, I think that there is, there is that hunger. And, you know, one thing that stood out to me from what Jessica had said, and it has been a question I've had reading her book and just thinking about this in general, is that, like, do co-ops exist in response to market failures? Like, is that, is, is there some notion that when markets stop acknowledging place people, that these are structures, or are co-ops structures that prevent those market failures in the first place? Um, and especially as co-ops enter the web, enter the, the internet, which they are now doing, and I'm advising a company that I think has a good shot to be close to a consumer, like global consumer product that is a co-op, um, then I think you maybe start to see uh, collective ownership, group ownership as a pet advantage, as a means of distinguishing yourself. Because I think ultimately the outcome of all of this will be 
you know, uh, greater control and probably a, a, at, the, at the top end, but then just a balkanization any different, you know, micro communities, micro services, the, the gas, the, the internet or today's version of the gas station in Gary, Indiana, as Jessica was saying. And I think that that, like, there's a lot of things to be excited about in that. And, and I feel excited about a number of things in that. Um, but we are talking about small green shoots in a machine of darkness that is potentially overwhelming us. Thank you for that very evocative way to end on that passage. Yeah, it's really, really interesting thoughts. And, and um, if I could just jump in quickly, Dan, yeah. the, um, now that you've finished, could you just refresh your screen? It will just help with the, um, with the audio yeah. and maybe the video too. There we go. And down. can I quickly answer his question um, about market failure or uh, I forget how he phrased the other option. Um, I actually think it's both and. So definitely in the research I've done about cooperatives as a community economic development strategy, I've seen it used for, I guess, in three different major ways. One, definitely in times of market failure, um, you know, in the, in the, even in the mainstream co-op movement in the U.S., if you take uh, rural electrification, right, our whole rural electric program, which is actually extensive, was basically market failure. Capitalists, um, electric companies would not electrify rural areas. And so um, we actually, the, the federal government during the New Deal helped to set up uh, a whole system of rural electric cooperatives so that we could electrify the rural part of the U.S. And that's definitely a reaction to market failure. And then, as I said, some of the survival co-ops that African-Americans and other groups have used have definitely been the market failed them. There was no market for what they needed at the time in their place, in their space, right? But I did also find and notice that there were also, especially among black leadership, there was a discussion about using co-ops for to create economic independence and control, right? So it didn't necessarily have to be market failure. If you take the Black Panther Party in the 1960s, it wasn't, I mean, yes, there was definitely still lots of exclusion and discrimination and um, pay of jobs were bad. And sometimes people wouldn't serve people who were in the Black Panther Party. So there was still some level of fail market failure, but a lot of it was a strategy to how do we take control over our communities? How do we um, handle our own economics so that gives us both economic, social, and political independence to do the things we need to do and to fight for the things we want to fight for. And so that's another way to think about ownership. Um, so it's not always that there's a void, there was nothing there. Sometimes it was very much about a strategy being proactive about how do we control our own resources so that we can do what we need to do with them and position ourselves to do even more. Um, right. And then the final, the third strategy, which is sort of an extension of this, um, the proactive strategy, I would say, is to think about um, alternatives for cr to create a whole future economy. And that has been not as strong as the other two motives. But I've also seen it where people, again, have been proactive to create to to position ourselves to create a whole, either whether sometimes they've talked about a whole separate black nation within the US and base that on a solidarity economy and a co-op economy. Um, there's a, a, a land trust called New Communities, which had thousands of acres of land to put into black owned hands so that blacks kind of have an autonomous space liberated space to do the things we needed to do um, away from uh, racial discrimination and that kind of thing. So I don't know if that's totally separate from the second kind of creating independence, but that strategy to create a whole future transformative economy has also been in the mix, though not as strong as the other two motives.
um, co-ops as a response to or even or a defense against market failure they're both they're both you know reactive as you say and and uh you know there obviously needs to be a proactive role of the co-ops as well you would hope otherwise they're just being defined by the thing they're opposing but then you also you get into that same dilemma about if you're carving out do you go off and carve out a space entirely separate or do you try and transform the economy that you're part of and i think we very much see that here in the uk as a constant kind of debate about the role of cooperativism here you know and whether it should be more focused on on speaking to the rest of the economy or it should be kind of focusing on building its own strength in a kind of separate separate place and that there's there's a tension there that i don't think has has been um resolved um or possibly ever will be but certainly it's a, it's a discussion that's worth having um Yancy, welcome back. I can't see you or Johnny now at the moment, but I assume you're both, <laughs> you're both here with your name during the session. So, um, yeah, just talking a bit about the, um, as you'll see from the notes in the chat, about the kind of different ways in which co ops have been seen. Um, I thought it'd be interesting now to talk a little bit. You know, one of the things that I think is, is curious about the role of ownership, we, we, you know, when we look historically and maybe economically, and think about kind of financial assets and so on um it's sort of fairly clear and, and and the importance of it is clear but you know in the modern context i think you know ownership is, is in crisis not only on from the basis of um you know thinking about large-scale assets but actually you know when i think about the things i own i probably own a lot less than 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 someone of my age and economic status would have done 10 years ago partly because ownership just isn't as big a thing anymore you know like my music i mentioned spotify earlier my music is effectively rented you know uh, if i uh, i go if i go out in a car i'll try not to use an uber but that's you know the way that 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 works i'm less likely to need a car and there are numerous other examples in which we, we're kind of moving into an economy it seems in some ways where we're less likely to own assets or or want to own assets anyway so how do you think we might deal with that tension when it comes to sort of promoting ownership um, going forward, I I think that um, ultimately we might regret that. Um, I keep thinking about there's a book I'm going to blank on the name, but a a, a book about um, uh, looking at basically the fall the fall of the Roman Empire, specifically studying uh, a poem. On the nature of things that the the author argues inspired the Renaissance, but one of the like remarkable things from the book that talks about the strength of the Roman Empire, all the knowledge that existed, and uh, and he the author mentions a book critic in 500 A.D. listing like here are the 200 most important texts of the Roman you know of the Roman epic that are still left, and lists all these books. And the author notes that today we only have like nine of those several hundred books still exist and everything else is gone. And the Romans thought all that was permanent. They thought all of that was permanent. And, and to me, losing this data, the culture, everything we're transferring to the brain uh, of the web, I view that as actually a, a really enormous vulnerability um, that actually people aren't properly thinking about it, it, it is my feeling. Um, and of course, it also just creates even more distance between workers. I don't want to think of a musician as a worker, it's an artist, but like through them and, and their labor, right? Like what, what they get from it. Um, if you look at every musician now, like, how, like what are you supposed to do in a COVID world? Like already you're your ability to sell a product has been removed by a market trying to gobble up, you know, size. Um, and now, and the same thing has happened in live music as well. Um, so, but just the, the thing I'm struggling with, um, and that's so hard about this, is it strikes me that like, thinking about the durability of these forms, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about co-ops as like spinning up in the, in the wake of a failure in response to something. Um, and then there's also, I think Jessica's book points out numerous times that these things might last for a decade or something, but then they would go away. Um, and so maybe a co-op is a bit more we could think of as like a nomadic structure or even like an, an improv structure, if you think of it in musical terms, um, which is like something alive and real and speaks to the energy of the moment. But it is something that 
you know, that is more, it's vulnerable to time. It's not meant to say with, withstand time. It is a non-structure uh, in a way. Um, and just like what is its strength then in the face of really overwhelming forces that are disadvantaging workers, that are removing agency from people? And that's, and that's where I hope for and believe there's a possibility of the web to bring the, to, to turn the co-op model into something that is more durable. Um, the company I mentioned, uh, the co-op that I'm advise and work with is called Ampled, which is a Patreon-like subscription service. So like you pay a certain amount a month, but it's a co-op and all the musicians who are on the service who have at least 10 supporters are a owner. And we had our first like community session last week. It was my first time being in a co-op meeting. And to hear the head, the founder of this say at the beginning, this is a space based on democratic governance. Like I got, I got chills hearing that. Like I've been in a lot of business meetings in my life and I've never heard anyone say that before. Um, and, and, and a lot of the discussion was actually quite interesting. It was this, it was a tension sort of speaking to what you, you mentioned, Daniel, of say musicians wanting to know where are the features that look out for my own, you know, my own sustainability. And then other people wanting to say, hey, are we going to like take on the industry with this form? Are we going to overturn, you know, the paradigm of ownership with this? And um, and what was helpful is that, the, you know, the founder said as a co-op, our mission is to look out for the needs of the co-op. So, yes, we might hope for certain things, but like our, our decision making must be biased there. Um, so just what, what I what I want is for these not to be the cute indie things you pat on the head for being so nice. It's so nice you do that. You know, I want these things to be tough. You know, I, I want them to, to, to have power and, and to have force and to be unafraid of that. And so as I just think about the long, the long termness of this, that, that's, that's what I hope to, you know, that's what I'd love for us to, a solution to emerge for. Great. Yeah, this Okay. conversation, I have sort of three categories of responses. So first I want to respond to your notion that I guess it's your generation is sort of a generation of renters, not owners. And I do think there's a problem with that similar to what Yancey was saying, but let me, um, let me put my own terminology to it. I actually don't really, I'm not a proponent of private ownership. I actually think too much private ownership and control over profit should be illegal. You know, I know I'm on recording saying that or whatever, but anyway. Um, but I do believe in collective ownership, right? And so I do think there's, we're in this position that, you know, 80% or 90% of the people are going to get wealthy and have all the wealth and make all the decisions for us and the rest of us will be renters and consumers, there is a problem with that. I mean, the first problem is they shouldn't be able to own it, but even if we forget about that and just what are the, eight, what are the rest of the 80% of us gonna do, we should be figuring out how to, how to create structured commons, right? We should be commoning, figuring out how we can jointly own stuff. So not as renters, because as renters, we have no control, no decision-making power, People can do things to us all the time and we're always reacting. As owners, we're being proactive. And so that's the question to me is how do we become collective owners of things? That's why I'm interested in community land trusts, worker co-ops, the ways that people together can own the things that we need to be able to control, not necessarily as an individual, but as a group of people who either live in the same place or work in the same place or live and work in the same place or care about the same community, that kind of thing. So I've been also trying to, I've been struggling with how to talk about um, community wealth and collective ownership, what that means and how we can achieve that. So that's where also like having credit unions instead of banks where we can all be in charge of the financial services and who makes the decisions about the finance and what happens to the money that we save, that kind of thing. Um, co-op housing, all that kind of thing. So that's the first thing I would say. I do think it's a problem if we're all renters, but I think the answer is not that we should all be privately owning stuff. We need to figure out how to jointly own things and how to do it very strategically and, and with a sense of a commons and, and protecting commons and that kind of thing. 
Um, and then we can also talk about gaining wealth because we'll all have this community wealth that we're part owners of, partly in control of. That should be enough if all the collective wealth that we're doing is to address our needs, right? Our survival needs, as well as our spiritual needs, as well as our cultural needs, right? Then we should be wealthy enough that way. We shouldn't have to have the individual wealth that people are striving for now. So that's sort of the wealth ownership side. The second thing that comes up to me in this conversation is the platform. And again, Yancey started to talk about the platform. I am becoming more, at first I didn't actually understand what platform cooperativism was, um, but I've come to really understand it, especially the last five years. And one of the things I understand is it's another, it's a structure, especially in this new 21st century, or I guess it's not new, in the 21st century, um, especially as we're going more digital and with COVID, we've had to even go even more digital faster than we ever imagined. But that means we should be prepared for the digital world to be to still be collectively owned and cooperatively owned. And that's where these platform cooperatives come in, the kind of structure you're creating, right? Um, we've got a notion for how to do platform cooperativism with Uber, right? Uber should actually be owned by the drivers and the riders, right? It shouldn't be owned by some private company that's scout, you know, pulling in riders with pretend discounts and uh, exploiting the drivers, right? The drivers and the riders should own the platform and should control that company. And so if we think about that, those kinds of platforms, especially if we have to do almost everything digitally, we, we know how to do digital co platform co-ops and we're learning more and more about them all the time. So we should be figuring out how to educate people more and push that as the solution to some of these things as we go forward, especially if we can't meet in, in person. A lot of people keep asking, well, how do you do a co-op if you don't meet in person, but you can do it. <laughs> Jessica, can I ask a question about, I love, I just about like your... and I just wanted to Remind me, I wanted to talk about longevity, another way to look at longevity, but go ahead. I was just gonna say like with the, I, I I agree with everything you're saying, and and, um, and thinking about like how drivers and riders might say own Uber together. Does that like say creating that? Does that does that require like a different relationship to capital? Is it like thinking of the creation of that as being all about labor rather than like the capital to fund the labor? What can you like sort of show me what what is behind that? How you do that? How you think about that? Yeah, I think we have to turn capital on its head in that sense, right? Um, you know, capitalism and the, whatever, the industrial revolution for whatever it is, 300 years now, whatever, has all been focused on means of production and capital, right? Um, I, I, I use a term from David Ellerman that um, capital has rented labor, but we need to change that and have labor rent capital, right? So capitalism shouldn't be the one that's supreme, labor, right? Even the whole co-op model, it doesn't spell it out as well, but if you read sort of between the lines in the co-op principles and values and stuff, they're really talking about sovereignty of labor over capital and use value over capital, right? So it's not just capital no longer has its place as the king, right? It's how much you use the co-op, how much you, what you need from the co-op, and then the people that put in the labor, whether it's, um, time, energy, sweat, equity, any of those things, right? So I think that's the thing we have to think about, right? We're privileging the work that human beings put in and we're privileging the needs that humanity has, right? That's what an economic structure and system should do. We, we know or we think we know that the best way to do that is through these collective democratic governance things where everybody owns and everybody helps to decide how do we make that work? That's where the, the, the work of it comes in, right? We have to be taught how to make decisions together, how to address conflict, how to do conflict transformation, right? We need to learn how to trust and work together or relearn it because most of the time we know it as human beings, but we don't know it as economic actors, mm -hmm. right? So we have to, again, turn it on its head, see, our, see economic actor, action as part of humanity. Right. What does it mean to be human? And then economics comes out of that, whereas economics right now is, you know, it denudes us of humanity in order to participate in current economic systems. So we have to turn all that stuff over in its head and learn how to be human again and, you know, 
have structures that help us to do that and that that help us to learn how to treat each other the way we should and want to be treated. Mm. I mean, that's, we could go into hours of this, but that's, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. that's the way yeah, well, to I, talk I, about I, it. Yeah. I just think, um, well, I think having that conversation about the valuing of labor versus capital in the, in the creation of startups, I think is really, is actually like uh, a point really w- worth pushing harder on because I think there's actually a tremendous opportunity for, a change in perspective based on that. And even, you know, I, I like have been in the tech world, you know, Kickstarter trying to do it the right ways and all the ways you can, but still like taking venture capital money, um, you know, in, in, in terms very specifically designed by us. But one thing that stands out from that is that, you know, when, when employees in a startup get hired and they get their equity grant, here's how many shares you get, um, the structure, the cap tables, all that is generated by VC firms. Like every every startup founder, when you start a company, you're like, what percentage do I give away? And you start Googling and you get five VCs, very helpful blog posts laying out, here's the various ways, here's the market rates. But what, what is the actual outcome of those market rates? It is to, it is to disvalue labor and to actually more highly value that money that's being put in. And that's like, that's like step one for any startup. And so even if even if we reimagine that step one is labor is not properly incorporated. Actually, all the cap tables everyone's using are totally wrong. You know, this right. fun. Right. Absolutely. Um, and and so I think that's yeah, it's you know, it'd be what would be exciting is is to where we can have what will feel like an apples to apples conversation with the capitalist where it is just like, Hey, here's, let's talk about outcomes. We want an outcome that looks like this does seem to be better for everyone. Now, I do think those kinds of results are possible on, on a long enough timeline. Yeah, I think, I think it is possible. And I see we have a lot of questions. I just wanted to make that my one last point about longevity. Um, and it's true that, you know, you said in my study, I didn't, not all the co-ops I found had long histories. Some of them did. I mean, some of them lasted 15 to 30 years. Some of them only lasted three or four years. Um, but what I learned about longevity is a couple things. The very first thing that's so important, again, through the co-op process and the co-ownership process, is that even when the official business or enterprise doesn't exist anymore, you can't erase all the learning and skills that got developed in that process. Um, And so learning how to work together, making decisions together, the skills that you get in that particular industry, some of the um, stability you get from having been in, even if it's a two or three year or not a 10 year stable economic relationship, being an economic decision maker, all those skills you still have. So I, you know, I couldn't follow most of the people who left a co-op, but when you do follow them, you find out they go on to do bigger and better things. Sometimes they even create another co-op or they get more involved in their civic activity. They go back to school and get other things. They do better in their family. They advocate for their children better. I mean, there's just a just a growing list of leadership and social and other kinds of things that happen in addition to economic stability and other economic things. Sometimes the co-ops ended because they actually fixed the market failure that they were started for. And so you can't even say that that's a failure that they ended because they did what their purpose was. They were addressing this market failure and they fixed the market failure and moved on. So the other piece I think that's so exciting for me about joint ownership and collective ownership, democratic economic decision making is how the process itself transforms and builds, develops human beings who go on and can do better and better and more things. And so it's never not worth doing because the outcome, there's always so many things in the outcome and so many ways that we can move forward as human beings because of the process. Yeah, I think there's there's definitely some opportunities for talking about the different ways, benefits of of, of cooperatism and cooperative ownership in different ways. And sometimes the focus has been on that sort of resilience and longevity and like, you know, in terms of the company, whereas actually, like you say, you know, the benefits actually been off in all sorts of different directions, and some of those are not necessarily appreciated. Um, so we've got a couple of questions, I think, here in the in the chat box from people. A uh, question for you, Jessica. 
um, from Ben Losman. Would you advocate for worker ownership over mega corporations like Amazon um, instead of, say, the abolition of Amazon? Um, and if you would, how can workers achieve ownership in the face of such brutal suppression of organized labor? Right. Well, I definitely believe that Amazon should become uh, a worker owned co op or even what we call a solidarity multi stakeholder co op. Again, uh, the users, the customers could also own with the, own, with the workers. I know some great models where um, the customers are owners, but the workers self manage the workplace. So the worker and the customers are owners, but the workers self manage their work sites. Um, so that you can still get some of that worker self-control, but also have a, a stakeholder ownership. I, I, how would we get Amazon to do that? That's a big question. I mean, hopefully Bezos has made enough money now off of Amazon that he might be willing to sell to his workers. I mean, US, uh, the U.S. law tax law does actually have some special tax credits to do that for anyone to sell to their employees and they supposedly get some tax benefits out of it. I don't know, basis that probably doesn't even pay taxes, so maybe he doesn't need those. But maybe um, if his customers demanded it, you know, or started boycotting if he didn't or something, you know, it would have to be, I guess, part of a larger movement um, to force him to do it unless there was some uh, marketing benefit he could get out of it. Um, but I think it's feasible, economically, it's feasible. Um, the question is, right, is there a will? So I, I, to me, it's about the political will. I think we know economically how to do these things, how to create these kinds of uh, co-ops and how to um, do the conversions. And as I said, there's even in the US, there's tax law in favor of these kind of conversions. I think it's really the political will and how do we get that? That's, you know, demonstrations, boycotts. Je that kind of thing. Jessica, do you think, what is your feeling on sovereign wealth funds? Do you think that's like too extracted? Is that, is that, I don't know if you've seen like Mariana Mazzucato has had proposals of, of things like you know, these. I, I don't know enough about it yet to answer that one. What do you think about well, it? Well, it's the idea that the state would take a, would take like a non-voting ownership uh, stake in companies of a certain size and those funds are just distributed broadly to the population, something like a UBI. But basically, I mean, I, I mean, one thing that strikes me, I, I my, my wife is Canadian. We moved here uh, earlier this year. And one thing I'm struck being here and and talking to folks here is um, some some friends I've made are like, why do you want businesses to be doing like like trying to solve climate change like government? government is on that like a business just has to like sell you a smoothie or whatever like why are you trying to you just have a strong state and then you don't then everyone just does their thing and you don't need to solve these things and and it's the sh the truth of that has struck me where i'm like oh wow we're trying to all find a way to solve these things ourselves when there's you know just a, some basic infrastructure can just take a lot of this burden off of people um and yeah yeah, I think my, I would say two things. I definitely believe that we should have more control over public money, right? So if that means sort of state ownership or some kind of state, you know, um, that's okay. But my biggest problem with the state is right now, the state's, most state apparatuses are not democratic, right? And I'm really about democratic economic participation. I really think it matters that everybody has to be in the same room and talk through the economics, look at the the numbers and make decisions about, you know, what to pay for, how to cover this. Who I think that makes a huge difference in us as human beings. And if the state apparatus is still bureaucratic and representative democracy and all that, then we're still we're giving up the natural right as human beings to help decide what, what we do economically. Mm. And so that's my problem. Mm. And I think the only way we can change the state apparatus is to start from the bottom up by practicing these economic democracy and perfecting it at a small local level. And then, I don't know what you call that, right. having it bubble. Forward. Yeah. More yeah. And more. Yeah. Right. I don't think we can legislate it from the top. I think that's been tried before and failed. 
So maybe again, ultimately some kind of state collective state ownership and control in some ways, but I don't, to me, it's not going to be what I, what my new world looks like if we haven't figured out how to do real participatory economic decision-making, right? We need participatory budgeting at the state, you know, municipal, state and federal levels. We, all that stuff, we're not there yet. But if we have more and more people doing these small platform cooperatives and platform cooperatives and the cooperatives get bigger and bigger and we still keep that democratic participation and right, then eventually we can have those, that kind of participation at the state levels. Mm. That's, that's how I see it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, see, in your in your work on on Bentoism, and what you've written about in your in your recent book, I, I was interested just to hear a little bit about your thoughts. I mean, that's a very ambitious sort of um, yeah perspective, you know, and, and on the very fundamental some of what we talked about today about value and and, and um, labour and the relationship between labour and capital, and it kind of starts from very much a, an analysis of the root causes of, of what's wrong with going today. So I, I was just interested in you know looking at that and how that connects with ownership and, and with cooperative ownership and, and particularly yeah. the sort of process that we, we've sort of described in broad terms there you know how where you see the opportunities are particularly um, in kind of growing this different way of, of, of operating yeah um, well bentwism is a, a framework uh, an ideology I created that's about seeing beyond an individualistic short-termism. So um, I believe that uh, we define self-interest today according to a now me perspective. What do I as an individual want right now? Um, but our, our self-interest is, is larger than that. And the, what I call a bento is just a two by two graph that shows four distinct spaces of self-interest to think about. Now me, what I want as an individual right now, future me, what the older, wiser version of me wants me to do. You know, I either become or don't become that person on a daily basis based on my decisions. There's also now us of the people we are responsible for and who are responsible to us. Our decisions affect them. And then there's future us, our kids if we have them or everybody else's kids if we don't. The truth of our actions is that they leave a footprint in all four of these spaces, but today we're functionally blind to everything other than now me. We think anything that's not now me is like irrational, emotional, like not worth thinking about. And so the story of the last 50 years of America, especially, is a hyper, hyper investment in now me and a degradation of every other space of social value. Um, what I lay out in the book and what my personal mission is, is to redefine what the world sees as in its self-interest and what is valuable in 30 years. This is a 30 year generational goal that I think is absolutely possible. And that as invisible as short-term individualism is to us today, we all see the world through this lens or many of us do. I think a lens that accounts for now and the future and the individual and the collective is like a very, not a simple step, but is a logical step. And, and I believe that it is one that will actually help us solve the problems that we're facing. And you know, I wrote this book, la the book came out last year, and I did like six months on the book circuit, like trying to convince people that our belief in now me and individuals, individualism was problematic, really kind of getting burnt out by having a lot of those conversations, you know, since COVID, since COVID, it's like, you know, everyone's like, hey, what's that idea that you were, that I didn't really listen to before? Like, that's interesting to me now. Um, and you know, what I imagined in, in writing the book and thinking about this is that we would enter a profound crisis. Um, and it's a, you know, we're, we're dealing with the post-individualistic crises of inequality, of unequal ownership, of the climate. Um, and ultimately we are going to have to create more collectivist solutions to solve that. And I, and I believe that what we're gonna find is that the millennial generation and the Y generation are going to be ready for that kind of mindset and that the, the internet has made us more of a networked organism and that we, we are gonna see people that are ready to step up into that. The problem is, is they just have old folks like us still in charge, still operating <laughs> on, you know, still fighting to get back this world that never existed in the first place. Um, so I, I do think that this is where this ultimately trends. And I, and I, I take an optimistic view of people that 
We're all doing the best we can with what we know. We just don't know so much. Um, but that this sort of fundamental shift of self-interest is the kind of change that I think makes the other kinds of decisions that we want to have happen, they become rational. They're not being made for political reasons or for moral reasons. They're just being made for reasons of outcomes and of reasons of safety and just like what we instinctively know to be right. So, you know, I, 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 I think this is very doable. I teach this to people like teach people how to use this mindset. Um, and, and, you know, those people come from all over the world in every walk of life. And then I also work with this in organizations and, and ultimately will be doing research, funding research to do what Thomas Kuhn would call the normal science of defining this new view of self-interest and making it practically usable, a real interface for people to, for it to be less hard to make better choices. That's fantastic, thank you. So Jessica, just to, to close that for a couple of minutes, I think, do you want to read a couple of minutes? Yeah, we've just got, um, yeah, three more minutes. So I just wanted to kind of connect back to the what we were talking about right at the beginning of this conversation when you talked about those sort of small um, cooperatively owned or co-ops that sprung up in the in the crisis um, that you described and like in response to the situation they were in and, and kind of just where you might see the opportunities today for that kind of springing up, what the kind of problems people are facing today that might encourage them to kind of uh, take on these alternative ways of doing things. Right, so I think we're seeing it. I mean, there's been a huge um, uh, kick up in the, um, in the mutual aid, right? People are actually calling them mutual aid funds, things like that. People are working together, right? What do you need? Who has something? You know, again, I know mostly about what's happening in the US, but even when we got that stimulus check or some people got a stimulus check, there were a whole bunch of people who were donating that, who didn't need it. Um, so one of the things I also try to do is to remind people that in some ways we already practice solidarity economics. We already do humane economic things, you know, very informally, of course, um, because again, we're, we're, we're trained to think that in, in our structured formal economics, we're not supposed to act like this, but in our day-to-day -day world, right? We carpool, well, nobody carpools anymore, but you know what I mean? We do a lot of sharing of resources, right? I babysit for you, you make me dinner, we carpool to this, we, you know. And so I also try to re get people to connect back to that, right? That, you know, that's why I keep saying it's about being human, because as human beings, we're always sharing and helping and connecting, right? And definitely in crises, you see that, people giving up stuff that normally they would never give up, but now they're willing to give it up because they see somebody else needs it more, or they give up one thing because they need something else. And so there's a lot of bartering, mutual aid going on. There's already a lot of ways that people are trying um, to even share, you know, whether it's food or health tips, that kind of thing. I mean, for the U.S., uh, I think we understand even better than ever how important both um, uh, universal health coverage as well as um, public, you know, understanding what public health really means now, right? We used to be very anti all that, but I think now because of the crisis, people really understand now what, pu what public health means, why we need a real pu functioning public health system, why we really need everybody covered by healthcare, right? Why having this, right? capitalist for-profit health system is just destroying us, right? So I think the moment where, you know, it's unfortunate sometimes that it takes a crisis for people to suddenly realize that all the stuff they thought they cared about or knew or whatever isn't really what really counts. But I think it at least gives us a place for people to say, you're right, that didn't work, that wasn't the right way this makes more sense, let's do this. And so then, uh, as Yancey said, they're willing to, to listen or to reread the stuff that they were just discounting in a new way. And so that to me is, is um, that's the hope. I, I feel like we, you know, it's sort of the Phoenix thing, right? From the ashes, you can get something, can develop big, beautiful, um, we have enough of the stuff floating around that if people now are ready to see it or grab it, 
they can. And then those of us who have already been talking and thinking and studying this stuff just need to get it out more and more. And I think, Yancey, you're probably having the same uh, experience, but I'm in more demand than ever to talk about these things. In fact, I'm, I'm getting inundated. I'm having to say no or push it off for two more months because I just can't do all the, give all the talks and write all the papers that people are asking me to do right now. So it definitely seems that people are ready and craving for the information that will help them move forward to a different kind of life. Cool. And that's a, that's a great place to, to finish. So thank you so much. Um, so yeah, considering you're in such demand, so great to have you, Jessica, and I um, hope you're not double booked for the residential next year. Uh, <laughs> just, just quickly, thanks again to Yancy. Um, thanks for Dan for chairing another session today. We've got a great day tomorrow. We're going to kick off with a morning magazine review with Hazel Sheffield, who's a journalist, the Guardian and Independent. Talking of mutual aid, we've got mutual aid to co-ops with Amar Deep Dillon, who's an organiser in southwest London, talking about all the mobilisations around mutual aid and the appetite for setting up co-ops. Um, we've got community leadership conversations from midday at 12. We've got a great session with Jess Steele from Jericho Chambers on self-renovating neighbourhoods. Um, looking at the difference between dereliction and gentrification and how communities can really be um, at the front of that. We've got a session with Cornwall Council's um, climate emergency team on what can councils do after declaring a climate emergency. And I've seen that we've had Sarah McKinley on the call today from Democracy Collaborative, um, of whom Jessica was a co-founder. Um, she's got a session on community wealth building beyond Corbynomics. Can it work elsewhere? Exploring after the election loss in um, in December, if um, community wealth building and its political appeal and base in the UK. So thanks again for joining us. Um, it's been a great and long day here for us that have been on this all day. And as you can probably tell, it's getting dark in the UK here. Um, so yeah, great time to finish. So thanks again um, and see you. Thanks so much. Bye. Thank you.